It's not calling you Josh Frydenberg, it's calling you Dosh Frydenberg. Under the coalition, taxes for hard-working Australians will always be lower. You know, I, I don't hold a hose, mate, and I, I don't sit your control room. They're answers that only can come from Victoria, I'm afraid, because that's not my job. But I ain't spending any time, though, because in the meantime, every three months, a person is torn to pieces by a crocodile in North Queensland. Well, g'day. Listeners, and thank you for joining us once again on the Two Jacks, where we go all the, all the way around the world and then return to Australia. In fact, we're starting with Australia today, and joining me, as usual, is Hong Kong Jack, all the way in Hong Kong. How are you, mate? Well, I've got a bit of a dodgy back at the moment. Well, really? You know, yeah, I just did the recycling. Heavy lifting? Yeah, well, I just did the recycling. It's amazing how much a, a fortnight's um, uh, empty wine bottles can, uh, can, can <laughs> weigh you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we don't go through quite as many uh, glasses. I just dragged my bin in. Uh, and uh, it wasn't all that heavy. Heaved it over the fence because my gate, uh, my side gate, is... Uh, basically falling apart and the bloke is coming to repair it or in fact replace it um, but uh, it's one of those COVID things there's still supply problems within the system and uh, he can't get the gate already so the, my gate is being held together by uh, Oki straps and uh, and uh, um, my recyclable uh, uh, lawn stuff um, bin and he's basically holding it together so the cats don't get out but look, more importantly, here we have Time magazine has listed uh, our Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, as uh, one of the 100 most influential people in the world for 2023. Um, every year, Time compiles a list of the 100 most influential people in the world in six categories, including artists, innovators, titans, leaders, icons and pioneers. And uh, Elba gets a mention along with uh, Justin Trudeau, Jack. Well, Justin Trudeau wrote the introduction for um, uh, for the Prime Minister Albanese. Um, uh, he said that from going up in public housing to, to taking office last spring as Australia's prime, new Prime Minister, he is a symbol of hope and inspiration. Mm. I just wonder whether having Justin Trudeau in your camps a plus or a minus. Well, it might not be an exact plus, but um, it is quite an extraordinary story, isn't it? I mean, we've seen prime ministers come and go, um, <laughs> more go than come uh, in the last uh, in the last ten or fifteen years, and they've all aspired to creating a sort of log cabin mythology about themselves. You know, the the Lincoln story growing up in the log cabin is the is the desired, uh, desired background for politicians to come from nothing. But in the case of uh, Anthony Albanese, raised by a single mother in public housing, it's actually quite true. Yeah. I think Justin Trudeau was raised in public housing too, but it was the Prime Minister's residence. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's just a, that's a little bit more glamorous there. Yeah, that's right. Um, we must, of course, uh, move on to the voice, Jack. Uh and uh, I did read Joe Hildebrand's piece on the weekend. I sent him a little note. I get on well with Joe. He's a good man. Uh, he thinks the voice ref referendum will uh, fail and blames the teals. You think it'll fail too, Jack. I've got to say, in the last week or so, I'm starting to feel uh, less optimistic about its chances yeah, Joe's theory was a little bit of a novel one, I thought. It was. Yeah, his idea is that um, partly through personal animosity, Simon Holmes of Court, who leads the, um, the Climate 200 people, which funded the Teals in large part, um, dislikes um, uh, Josh Frydenberg um, uh, and made sure that um, uh, Kuyong was one of the seats at the Teals um, campaign. I don't know whether Simon Holmes of Court doesn't like tennis players. That might be. That might explain it. You know? um, Golfers, possibly. Yeah, possibly. Uh, at, at any event, Joe's theory is that because the Teals targeted Josh Frydenberg, Josh Frydenberg lost his seat. Without that, he would have been the um, leader of the opposition, 
and he would have supported the voice. Therefore, Simon Holmes, according to Teal, are responsible for the voice failing. It's a bit of a stretch. I'm a fan of Joe's too, but that's a bit of a stretch. That is a, it, look, it is a bit of a stretch, but, it, but it's quite true. But, but we are talking about alternative universes here, yeah. uh, aren't we? And um, alternate universes. And, and look, that is that is definitely one. And, and you can say... Um, well, I don't know that you could say with any certainty that that uh, it had Josh won in Kuyong that he would have beaten Dutton. Given no. the makeup of the Liberal Party room at the moment, yeah, you yeah. might say Dutts might have got up anyway. Yeah, that's that's what I think actually. Yeah, yeah, I think it falls down right there. You know, and meanwhile, uh, Pat Farmer, uh, Jack, a former Liberal MP, one of. Uh, one of John Howard's battlers, uh, representing uh, an outer Western Sydney seat for a long time, uh, he's gone for a bit of a jog. He's, he's jogging f- basically from Tasmania. I don't know how he gets across the Bass Strait, but I'm sure they know this. He's going all the way from Tasmania to Uluru in, a, I think, 170 days or 175 days he's due to get there. Hmm. Uh, pretty amazing thing. He'll be, he'll be running 80 kilometres a day, Jack. Hmm. Uh, I think I'll be hopping on the plane. So. <laughs> it does sound pretty hard. I I heard an interview with him on uh, on uh, uh, the ABC news programs yesterday. He's been running a marathon, and of course he has to run two of those every day now. But he's been running a marathon every day for the last month in preparation. Pretty extraordinary mm. stuff, isn't it? I hope he listens to our podcast while he's running. He is, but he's also doing a bit of a tour on The Voice too. He's uh, he's very much pro The Voice. And so he's got, um, there's a journalist following uh, following his jog as well, uh, cameras, all those sorts of things. And and it's a bit of a community engagement about about The uh, the Voice, promoting The Voice uh, and his support of it. Um, so it'll wind its way through uh, Tasmania, Victoria, God, New South Wales, I presume, and then uh, there'll be some. There'll be some moments there when there's a whole lot of nothing until he mm. gets to Uluru. Mm. Mm. Um, what have you made, Jack? What have you made, Jack, of Peter Dutton's uh, tour of uh, Alice Springs? His second in well, probably three months, uh, where he's highlighted uh, controversially has highlighted. Um, uh, child sexual assaults within Indigenous communities, Jack. What did you make of all of that? Uh, not much in so far as I don't think it affects the voice, um, the chances of the voice much at all. I don't think Dutton's a relevant player in this. Right. Well, explain that. Um, I don't think it's going to be decided on strictly party lines. Um, Dutton's not popular. He can't swing the boat one way or the other, I don't think. I still think it won't succeed, um, but it won't succeed because um, uh, the proponents of the voice, the government, are going about it in the wrong way. Well, I want to talk about that a bit today, Jack, because your your sort of model fits into that sort of Julian Lisa model, doesn't it? That, uh, well, I, that- I don't have a particular model in mind. What I think the government's got wrong specifically is, first of all, I don't agree with the model they've put up, but the, the process has been wrong, and the process has been... Let's spend um, six years working up a model with the Aboriginal community and then six weeks working up a model that the whole community will support. And it's not the constitution of the 10% of the population or 5% who are Aboriginal. It's not the, it's not the, the constitution that belongs to the politicians who negotiate with them. It's the, it's the constitution, the document belongs to all of us. And they got that. They got that process arse about. They should have spent as much time as they needed to with the Aboriginal community, and then a long time with the wider community, finding a way forward that would have majority support. Well, that's and the have, and haven't done that, that. That's the marketing side of things. Um, no, that's, not, that's not marketing. That's process. That's getting the that's getting the proposal right, and they haven't gone about that the right way. But you've you proposed a model in previous episodes that that suggests that that the parliament. Uh, uh, will that it should be left to the parliament to legislate it, a legislative model on the voice, rather than a constitutional recognition model. No, um, I, I, I never proposed that. That was Labor Party policy back in about two thousand eighteen, which was to legislate for a voice, get that up and running, sort out its problems, and then put it into the constitution. That, that's not my proposal. That was a proposal by Bill Shorten and Pat Dodson back in twenty eighteen. 
and, and but the difficulty with that model, with a legislative model, is is that it can actually be compromised. It can be compromised by successive governments uh, who decide, a la ATSIC, that it basically needs to be chopped down. So if it just sits as legislation, it can be overridden by successive governments coming coming forward. The, 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 the issue here is not and, just... And can I just say, I would agree with that, which is why it's not my proposal and it's not something that I would support. I was merely pointing out that was Labor Party policy as recently as a few years ago, yeah. five years ago. But, but, um, but that is the Lisa think, model too. I, I if you want, to, we, we, we just we just move on from you for a minute. But that's the Lisa model, isn't it? That that you have the voice um, enshrined in legislation, but not the constitution. And the no, difficulty that's, that, that's with not that Lisa's is, model. Lisa's model either. All Lisa wants to do is to take the second paragraph out of the proposal. I don't think that's enough. Oh, well, that's the advice to the executive, and yeah. and the response to that is that the voice, you know, the, the voice, you take the executive away. The issue with that is that um, um, the executive is basically, you know, the 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 blacksmith of of policy and and legislation. That that's where it's founded, uh, and once things get into the parliament. Uh, then <clears throat> and, and from through the executive, then it's often too late for advisory bodies like the Voice to have any impact. Um, yes, um, I think that's that's possibly right. Um, it just depends um, which bits of the proposal you need to constitutionally enshrine. Um, you can do two things at once with this. You can have constitutional recognition of Indigenous people um, uh, and uh, and some guarantee, say, of a voice to Parliament and you might legislate for, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, sort of how much access they get to, whether it's ministers of state, and there's a distinction between the executive includes ministers of state, but it also includes a public service just doing a, a, a routine administrative task. And no one really knows how that's going to work. Uh, I noticed in the committee the other day um, uh, what's her name, Megan, um, is it uh, Megan Davis, the Professor yes. Megan Davis? Megan uh, Davis and Anne Toomey and another professor were, had, took quite two quite different approaches to this. They, 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 you know, they were arguing two different sides of the story, if you like, um, and they're both proponents of the voice. Um, and um, and, and if, you, if you're worried about how it's going, um, I heard Frank, saw Frank, Frank Brennan on the television uh, this morning um, a reminding people of Bob Ellicott, who was the Attorney General who was responsible for three of the eight successful referendums in Australian history. And Ellicott's first rule was rule number one, make sure you have no ambiguity, no different interpretations, um, and no argument about what the law actually means. And they're failing, they're failing on rule number one. Yeah, okay. Well, that's an Ellicott decision. The other thing I'd say about about this. It's been 24 years since we had a referendum in this country. Hmm. This is the longest period in Australian political here in, in Australian political history between referenda, uh, beating uh, uh, the last record holder. That was the 51 referendum, essentially to constitutionally uh, ban the Communist Party put forward by Menzies, and the 67 referendum um, that uh, um, uh, sought. To, to well um, um, uh, revoke a number of constitutional um, uh, elements uh, and uh, and include uh, Indigenous Australians uh, in the census, as well as uh, allow the federal government to create laws around Indigenous Australians in the states as well as the territories, which got up by 91% and, and got through in all states. That was a, obviously 16 years apart. So m my point is that a lot of the rules that we have around referenda, given the time frame between the last one, and the last one was a botched attempt to establish a republic, um, uh, may not may not uh, still uh, still uh, be the be the be the case, Jack. I mean, it's clearly. I mean, I did joke about this. Maybe the Liberal Party hasn't thought we've changed since nineteen ninety nine, but uh, the country definitely has changed uh, profoundly demographically. Um, 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 and and, uh, and in all other ways in the last 24 years. 
Yeah, I think the reasons referendums fail in Australia, generally speaking, remain the same. Yeah, I, I guess what I'm saying is I don't really buy this this argument uh, that um, that because there's no bipartisan support, that means the referendum will fail. And I know we're talking slightly about slightly different things here. Well, um, I, I would agree with you on that. That's why I don't think Dutton's relevant to this argument at yeah, all. Yeah, it's an interesting point you make, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, did you see Look, Susan I, Lay I, I, over the I, week? I, I, Sorry, don't think it's, I don't think it's going to be a party political thing. I don't think it's going to be Labor well, versus I, I, Liberal. I certainly think the Liberal Party wants it to be, Jay. They, they may want it and Labor may want it as well. Um, so, so I don't, but, but I don't think that's relevant, really. I don't think this is not going to succeed or fail on what um, uh, uh, political arguments Albanese or Dutton make. It's going to succeed or fail because it gets the support of enough people in the general community, and they're not going to look at this as a Labor or Liberal thing. Um, and that's why I think that the that the practice, the, the experience of previous failed referendums and successful referendums is a useful guide. Uh, piece in the, in, in the Fin Review over the weekend, Jack, that uh, an unnamed source within the Liberal Party said to be very close to Dutton, but an anonymous source, uh, make of it what you will, said that, um, uh, uh, that Peter Dutton pretty much had to uh, support the no proposition um, because they believed that the Liberal Party would lose members and support uh, in the broad Australian community if they didn't. Well, I think that's probably right, but I don't think that affects the outcome of the referendum to any great extent. Did you see Susan Lay as the Deputy Leader of the Opposition uh, and a Liberal? Uh, uh, she um, uh, she she said that uh, we might you know the, the date of Anzac Day might be changed, Jack. Yeah, there'll, uh, be all the sort, there'll be all sorts of people saying all sorts of things, and there are, uh, but none of that I don't think is going to make that much difference. If you're, if you're running the, 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 the no case saying things like that, that's not going to help you. If you're running the yes case implying that people who are opponents of it are racist, that's not going to help you either. Yeah. I, I just think I just think that we are starting to get into some pretty creepy sort of stuff, Jack. Particularly around Alice Springs. I, I I I looked at the Twitter feed for um, the action in Alice Springs group, and look, um, you could say that they're sort of ambulance chasing a bit. Uh, they uh, were um, not just promoting. Um, uh, a crime, property crime and personal crime issues in Alice Springs, but they were in fact uh, sending out a, um, a video from Darwin where a group of Indigenous uh, uh, Australians were uh, walking out of, a, I think, a bar um, and grabbing uh, grabbing bottles of booze off the bar and, uh, and then causing a bit of a scene outside. Not unlike what you might see at any number of uh, nightclubs, and we'll get to that shortly, uh, on any given day. And then I went through the comments, Jack, and are pretty ugly, um, and and this is this is what I'm really concerned about that that we might be sort of unleashed that this sort of failure of um, of bipartisan support will lead to um, particularly if the no vote does get up a really sort of um, um, entrenched uh, racist view around Indigenous Australians. And, and certainly the stuff, I mean, there were references to Indigenous Australians being savages, uh, <laughs> in, in, in Indigenous Australians being denied any financial support from the Commonwealth uh, until they learn to live on their own two feet and all this sort of stuff. The sort of, you know, the sort of rhetoric that we've been listening to for a very, very long time from extremist white Australia. Yeah, if you... if you know anything about what's happening in the Northern Territory in the remote communities and places like Alice Springs, et cetera, um, you know it's a pretty ugly situation. I don't think any of that's relevant to the to the constitutional amendment. It might not be I, relevant, because, Jack, but because I, it, 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 because the, it's the definitely voice is not, not going to fix this. The voice is but not going to fix that. It's definitely not relevant. Yeah, I mean, I think you're talk, I think you're sort of stuck in the esoteric here, and and you're failing to see the sort of serious divide that can occur, particularly if. You're correct, and the no vote the no vote gets up in three states or fails to win a majority nationally. Um, that there is an, a, a, there is a sort of we've sort of loosed a few monsters in the Australian community that have been silenced for a long time, and I think that's of real concern. 
Yeah, well, I would blame the government for that um, because that's why it was important to get the process right. I'd like to see a referendum, a referendum on this succeed. I don't think the current one will succeed, and that's because I think the government got the process wrong. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, we'll see about all of that. We've still got some distance to go. Of course What would you think if you were trying to succeed with a referendum, um, uh, when would you go? October, November, December? Um, Next year. (coughs) Just stick with what's available. October, after the footy finals, uh, November or December. My view would be either October or November rather than December. Um, uh, it, it certainly shouldn't be in December. The problem is they want to do it this year. That's the problem. Yeah. I mean, is that absolutely etched in stone, though? No, it's not. Yeah. Uh, and, and it may well be that we do go some way down the path. I, I, I imagine that it would exhaust... Um, it would exhaust a lot of people, uh, and, and, uh, you know, emotionally, uh, as we have this debate going through the country, and there are some ugly elements, as I say. Um, the the no um, the no ex- the no case uh, 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 they um, released their uh, their campaign advertising yesterday. Jack um, Warren Mundine, uh, I uh, listened to being interviewed yesterday, and uh, Warren, who I know personally. Warren made the point, and I think it's the point that I made yesterday. And that, and and their camp, the campaign there is: if you don't understand it, don't vote for it. Yeah, but, and that's good advertising because that's the experience of Australian uh, referendum. It's, it's it's backing up what Bob Ellicott said. If you've got um, uh, different interpretations, it won't succeed. And the, and and on yesterday's evidence before the committee, the current proposal is attracting different interpretations from professors, uh, different professors, all on the on, on the yes yes side. So um, that's I the problem. I did there, see God. Kenneth Hayne, former. I've got that right, haven't I? Former um, Kenneth Hayne. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did see him uh, reply to this this idea, which is being promoted again, and I think it's a, definitely a scare tactic. But um, uh, <coughs> that you know, the the voice would essentially have a veto power over the government, and uh, and he absolutely jumped all over that. Well, the dispute yesterday really was this: uh, was it yesterday or Friday? I can't remember which. Well, Hayne um, was speaking on Friday. Yeah, um, uh, that uh, the, I, I call it the Megan Davis view is that, um, so the Ann Toomey view is that the um, voice won't be able to interfere um, uh, in the executive action except to talk to ministers. They won't be able to talk to a, a public servant or anything like that about what's happening. They won't be notified of what's happening. Um, uh, the most they ever had, would, there would be an email address they could send off an email and say, I don't, I don't agree with this. Megan Davis was saying, and and the Aboriginal proponents, particularly the the Indigenous proponents of the voice, have been saying this for some time, is that's not right. We want to be inside that room when these decisions are made. Um, And there's there's your two interpretations of the same proposal, and that's a problem. Okay. Well, yeah, Kenneth Hayne was pretty decisive in his uh, takedown of the sort of Susan Lay nonsense that... You know, the uh, the voice would uh, create a new date for the AFL grand final and all this sort of, you know, absolute rubbish. Um, and, and just absolutely jumped on that. And I, I've also mentioned Brett Walker, and Brett Walker came up uh, also on Friday, although not in the committee hearings, to talk about some of the nonsense around the voice. We are going to get a fair bit of that. I, I suspect that some of the negative stuff is actually going to work against the no proposition. You know, the sort of stuff that I mentioned before from the um, uh, the uh, the advocacy group in, in Alice Springs and some of their followers. Um, I, I think that's going to, I mean, it does certainly have the, a capacity to divide the country, and that's my big concern. Um, <clears throat> but um, but I think that you know some of this more um, florid and hysterical stuff coming from the likes of Susan Lay is it, it basically going to work against the no vote. Well, I think the more florid stuff from either end is going to work against the interests of the proponents who are putting it. Um, 
Well, one thing we're waiting for, Jack, and and uh, and Anthony Albanese was interviewed on Seven Thirty Report last night. At Seven Thirty calls itself now, um, and uh, and he said that the Solicitor General's advice would be made available by the Solicitor General, and I and I gathered from his words that that, that was coming very soon. That'll be something to watch, won't it? Um, yes, we'll, we'll see how that all pans out. I just clear up the question about the date of the referendum. That's set by the Constitution uh, on the passing of the legislation authorising the referendum. I yes. think it's I think it's two months, and then it's got to be in that gap. But it, it, it has to so, be. I think there, so, yeah, so. There, there is a sort of sixty day period once yeah. it passes the Parliament. Yeah. yeah. So, so, but but that that doesn't kick in until that legislation's passed. So. There's, there's no, there's no re- that legislation could be passed at any time of the parliament's mm. choosing. It could be, um, as I think it should be, um, uh, in about June next year. Yeah, and it will get through the parliament. There's no question that it'll yep. that uh, that uh, that it will. So yeah, look, that that, that is something to watch. Perhaps, um, perhaps we might look at a, um, a a sort of February or March referendum rather than a, an October one and we get a little bit more clarity on the voice. We still, I mean, I did notice when uh, when it was put to Albanese about um, um, the, the Megan Davis proposition uh, that he still seemed very unclear about how the... Um, uh, the regional and <clears throat> the regional voice voices would be established, and I don't think anyone sort of understands <clears throat> at this day, excuse me, um, uh, how the voice itself, that group, how it will be created, uh, and whether it will be created by election or selection. Uh, and uh, and whether if it is done by election, whether it'll be overseen by the Australian Electoral Commission or some other body. Those, um, those are the things that I think we need to hear. And they need to have time to sink in so that people decide it's a good idea or a majority of people do. If you try and rush this, it will fail, is my opinion. Um, All right. I, I, okay. actually watched, I actually watched Q&A last year, last one. I know you're not a fan. It was from Mildura. Um, and much to the surprise of Stan Grant, their two Aboriginal participants um, were at least sceptical about the proposition, the, the current proposal. Yeah. Who knows with the bad show, Jack, just what's exactly – who gets who gets through the audience there? Who knows? Yes, anyway. Yeah, uh, it's, a, uh, it's, it, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a failed show. Watching it last night, the biggest problem is they always have a – current government minister and an opposition um, uh, spokesperson. And so it turns into a political shouting match between the two. If they bothered to watch the show that they based Q&A on, uh, I think it's called Question Time in the Question UK. Question Time in the, in yeah. the UK and, um, in, and in Ireland. Yeah, they never do that. Um, or I ne- I've never seen that happen on those shows and I watch them a bit. Um, it's just, it, it needs fixing. Yeah, well, I think it just needs um, <coughs> demolition. But anyway, um, Lydia Thorpe, Jack, uh, in the papers again. Yeah. You must have seen it. Um, I've seen the video, yeah, yeah. I think there's some confusion that she was turfed out of a strip club, and that does not appear to be the case. Uh, the reports are indicating that she was uh, – uh, enjoying libations at the Brunswick Club, which, as uh, many of us will know, was is a pub uh, in uh, in Brunswick. Not I think a, it's not called a club, think, not an RSL, not a not a licensed club. Uh, I think it's, it's called club. Maxine's now. Is it? Yes. Uh, it's the scene of a gangland murder, of course. Um, uh, one of the Morans was uh, was killed at the Brunswick Club, shot dead, and that released also unleashed all sorts of uh, issues uh, for Victoria Police and uh, for the for the villains involved. And Bert awesome. Rout, who uh, I got to meet many times, he was shot, I think, four or five times. Bert Rout, he was not a young man when he was shot. Um, but he uh, went on to recover, and I spoke to him after that. He's quite a character, Bert Rout, now deceased, but uh, managed to survive being uh, being shot four or five times. Uh, but anyway, it, that was it, the it, venue where Lydia it, thought was, and then I think the speaking, the- of, speaking of the venue, it was also this it's also the setting for a wonderful movie called Death in Brunswick. Um, oh yeah, uh, yeah, Great starring film. the late, starring the late um, uh, John Clark and um, uh, and uh, who's the the, the New South the, the the New Zealand vineyard on uh, uh, Sam, uh, well, Sam Farmer, Farmer yeah. and actor, uh, yeah, yeah, Sam Mill. 
Um, yeah, great, great film. Uh, and and Clark is just hilarious in it. It, it was actually a book published <laughs> with a little bit more trivia here. It was a book published by uh, Heinemann in my day, back in my day. Yeah, um, I met the, I met the author. Uh, picked up for film. I met the author. He used to uh, be a bit of an habitué of um, Carlton uh, uh, boozing houses, I think. Decent Dino, guy. Yeah, I think Dinny O'Hearn, O'Hearn introduced us at the, um, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the little pub, across the road from Percy's Pub, I can't remember what it was called. Yeah? The Blush and Stutter, not that one, but the one across the road from yeah. the Blush and Stutter. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Um, anyway, yes, yeah, so uh, <coughs> the Brunswick Club, was the scene of uh, many libations, I gather, just looking at the footage for Lydia Thorpe. Uh, and then she emerged from there. It was a 50th birthday of a friend, it was explained. And then she emerged from there where uh, it seems like she was taunting the security outside a strip club there. I don't know that she entered. I think there's some confusion <laughs> around that she did, but I don't think that's the case. And, um, and uh, look, uh, people have said that this is Lydia, she, she unleashed a, a torrent of verbal abuse to the security guards uh, and uh, and the security guards were really funny. One, one guy said, God, imagine she's in Parliament. And another, another one said, look, can you just go away, please? And while well, she sort of you know, she got in their faces, and uh, uh, but it was not a physical altercation in any way. A lot of people have been saying that this is her way of basically creating publicity around herself, and I did notice that she'd re- returned to Twitter, probably with a little bit of a hangover on the Sunday, and had a bit of a chat with Neil Mitchell. Uh, 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 Mitchell said, well, you haven't made yourself available on my radio program, whinge, whinge, whinge. Um, he said, oh, okay, we, we can do that. But it really wasn't to me a, a look-at-me moment from, from Lydia. It was Lydia who just had she, – she was heavily refreshed. Let's just say that. I think that's that's what Lydia looks like when she's heavily yeah. refreshed. As, as a friend of mine puts it, I was overserved. She was. <laughs> she probably did breach um, at she, the Brunswick Club. We don't uh, want to put them in any sort of legal disputes, but she may well have uh, breached. What, what are they sort of the safe serving of alcohol? The, the, the RSA. The RSA. The RSA. Right. She might have got. She, she probably should have been RSA. Probably about one o'clock rather than three. Yeah. Um, I, I noticed that the club has uh, put a life ban on her. Um, the strip club, I think. The strip club. Life, <laughs> yeah, a life I don't ban think on she her. actually I entered the premises. <laughs> In the first place, um, so she won't be too bothered by that. Um, all I can say is the Greens must be going. Oh God, thank she, thank God she resigned from our party. They must yeah. be very pleased with all of there, that. There have been a few uh, people from across the parliament, from various parties, saying, "Look, you know, um, we should be looking at this, you know, with a view to uh, taking action against and all that." Sort yeah, well, of stuff. Pauline, and, Pauline referred it to the Victoria Police Force. So, I, yeah. I, on what on what basis? I have yeah. no no and, idea. Uh, offensive uh, behaviour, uh, offensive language in public; those sorts of offences are no longer offences in Victoria anyway. Yeah. Um, but poor old Pauline, I, I I still think Pauline's just a bit terrified that Lydia Thorpe's just sitting very very close to her now. Yeah, and, uh, and Tanya, Tanya Plibersek was, uh, was you know, um, looking very Furrowed stern, brow. Uh, yeah, furrowed brow and saying well, we should be looking. Uh, I think they all ought to calm down. Uh, uh, Senator it's, Thorpe. It's not the first time, uh, if memory serves, uh, not the first time a, f- a federal parliamentarian has been well refreshed, Jack. No, 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 no. And it won't be the last. It won't no, be the last. last. No, no, no. It, yeah, it wasn't a look at me thing. It was just this is what Lydia's like when she's had a few and she'd yeah. be a handful just quietly. She yeah. would be a handful. Yeah. Now, more serious matters, Jack, we're going over the United States and, and we, you know, we are sort of looking at the abortion laws and where they are now. Can I, can I stop you right there? I, I looked up the Merriam-Webster dictionary um, uh, uh, this morning. Um, and abortion is classified now as an archaic term um, uh, that should no longer be used. It Termination. Should be re- it should be reproductive health care. Reproductive health care. Okay. Can we can we can we at least settle on the term of termination? Um, <laughs> no, we can call uh, them we can call them abortions, and 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 the and the language police can can you know. You can sort themselves out. And, they can, and, yeah. You know, Merriam Webster's can go to hell just quietly. But um, uh, since uh, Roe v. Wade was swept aside by the Supreme Court, 
when was that? 21, 22. Yeah. Um, 22. Um, uh, uh, abortion uh, under state law, um, um, 13 states continue to have near total bans on abortion, and that is 43%. This is according to the Wall Street Journal. 43% of women of reproductive age live in these 13 states, Jack, which is a staggering number. Um, you mentioned at the time when Roe v. Wade was swept aside and sort of it, it more or less referred to the states that sooner or later things would things would come to a um, uh, that the people would sort these things out uh, at state elections. It's just not really happening at the moment. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I didn't think. Firstly- I didn't think- I didn't think it would happen by now. I've got to say. No, no, I, I, I fully appreciate that. But there, but there's actually been some very, very strange laws implemented uh, in response to it for, by some of the states. Idaho just last week, uh, well, on March thirty first, so it was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Idaho's Republican led Senate passed legislation on March thirty first that would basically criminalise. Um, anyone who assists a minor across state lines to get a, we'll say, termination without the permission of a parent or guardian, that's a two to five year, um, two to five years in prison. So a friend, um, uh, another family member uh, assisting a, a person under the age of 18 getting abortion going into state to do that would, would face a jail uh, jail term in Idaho while we stick with it um, is currently enforcing a total abortion ban with exceptions for rape, incest or the life of the mother. Uh, Kansas, although Kansans voted in favour of state abortion, Jack, in a referendum, the Republican-led state Senate has passed a prohibition on prescribing abortion pills via telemedicine. The House is considering the measure. Uh, Montana's got some issues there. Um, North Carolina House Republicans have introduced a bill to ban abortion from conception except to preserve the life or health of the mother. Abortion is currently legal up to 20 weeks in North Carolina. Uh, South Carolina, despite the fact that the state Supreme Court recently struck down a six-week ban uh, on abortion in a 3-2 vote, Republicans have introduced near-total abortion ban and six-week ban this year. Both bills have passed one chamber and have been transferred to the other for consideration. Texas, while abortion is completely banned, with very limited exceptions in Texas, Republican state representatives have introduced legislation that would compel internet providers to block websites that supply abortion pills or provide information on how to obtain an abortion. Gee, the party of freedom, Jack. What's going on there? Uh, Utah, Republican Governor Spencer Cox in March signed legislation to prohibit the licensing of abortion clinics which abortion rights advocates say would effectively eliminate access in the state. Abortion is currently banned after 18 weeks in Utah. In Wyoming, the Republican-led state legislature passed a bill in March banning the use or prescription of medication abortion pills, and it's been signed into law by Republican Governor Mark Gordon. It's due to take effect July 1. Abortion is currently legal until viability, about 24 weeks. In Wyoming and in West Virginia, Republican state senators have introduced a bill to remove the rape and incest exceptions from the state's near total abortion ban, which is currently in effect. Let's just start with the Republican Party, because they're really not the party of freedom, are they? I mean, it's their version of it, but but the, the, this is the party of imposing state values on 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 the populace. Um, this is not a Republican Party position. This is a, the position of the um, pro life or the anti abortion. Uh, groups that have existed because for 50 years they've existed since Roe Ro- Ro v. Wade. Abortion wasn't a terribly controversial um, thing in the United States until Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade was a terrible error by the court. Um, uh, it messed up the politics of, of the United States for 50 years. Um, so you'd, it, it, because of Roe v. Wade, it developed this uh, obsession with part of the right to get rid of um, uh, abortion altogether. Um, most Americans don't agree with that. Uh, a majority of Americans are, w- would like to see and will eventually see, I'm sure, um, a situation like most of Western Europe 
where um, abortion up to about 15 or 20 weeks is sort of okay. After that, it's much more difficult. That's where it will end up. Well, I mean, <laughs> let's just stick with, I mean, the fact that neither neither old, two old white blokes should be talking about, unless we develop a functioning uterus in some some point in the, in the near future, neither of us should be talking about these things other than to highlight some of the reaction to the dismissal of Roe v. Wade, that well, these well, are I'm, not decisions for us to make personally. It, and these I'm, are I'm decisions for women to make in consultation with their doctors. Well, and I'm, let's I'm, just I'm, leave it at that. That's no. basically it, isn't it? That's no. that's basically where the where the line should be drawn. I mean, look at West Virginia. I can tell you how many people are in West Virginia. I could actually figure out how many people, how many women are of reproductive age are in West Virginia. But if they if if, if they are subject to rape or incest, uh, they can basically suffer an, ab- an abortion ban. They will be required by law to give birth to that child. Now that is absolutely insane. I agree. What, and I'm not suggesting that I, I'm going to decide what happens. I'm saying that's what the population will decide because they do all around the Western world. They all come to much the same conclusion. The judges on Roe v. Wade thought by handing down that judgment they would end the political battles over abortion. They didn't. They made them worse. Um, that, 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 that's, it, that's all in the had, deep history. It, since it, Roe, since had, Roe v. Wade has been swept aside, I mean, you need to be very clear about this. Since Roe v. Wade was swept aside, we can deal with the esoterics, but right now there is this profound reaction from Republicans, from conservative Republicans in 13 states that, that are making abortion, are making, uh, making women... Um, uh, uh, making it more difficult for women to make med- their own medical choices, and yeah. that is a disgrace. With my, to disgrace, as far as I'm concerned, we'll move on to uh, Florida just, in a minute. No, no, we're just, not moving off on the topic, but we'll move on to Florida shortly, where they're yeah. banning books. Jack, this is not the party of freedom. This is the party of uh, basically almost totalitarianism. Are we talking about abortion or we just want to have a slash at the Republicans? Well, we may as well have a res- – because these are the people that are bringing it in, Jack. These are the people who are, who are, who are bringing in these laws that you believe are, are, are not representative of, of their constituencies, of the populations in their states. And what happens when people bring in laws that are not representative of the views of their constituents? They lose power. And this will happen. Well, so, so what are we talking about? How long? 10, 15, 20 years? How, 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 many, how, how long are you going to sit sort of blandly sort of passing away? This is, oh, Roe v. Wade was a mistake in the first place. I mean, how long? How long are women well, going me, to be how, me, how long are women going to be oppressed in these places? So 43% of, America's, um, of, of, of American women who are of reproductive age. 43%. Let me finish the, let me finish the story. If there was no Roe v. Wade, these things would have all been battled out 40 years ago, right? I don't and buy they, it. And they I wasn't, simply and don't they, buy it. And now they have to be battled out because there is no alternative. That's I simply don't buy any. That's how democracy works. Because in, in the subsequent Roe v. Wade years, many of these states that we've named today have brought in trigger legislation in the event that Roe v. Wade was overwhelmed. Not expecting that would ever happen. They're like the dog who caught the car. But then they've kept then they've kept going, Jack. They're, so when Roe v. Wade was dismissed, I mean, look at look at West Virginia's position. Look at it. So I mean, they so basically they will, now and they've they had their trigger office. laws, and then they've gone. Oh, hey, we just well, well we want to take the exceptions of incest, rape, uh, and the mother's health. We want to we want to remove those exemptions. And that's how democracy works. They will lose office. When's West, Virginia, when's West Virginia going to turn blue at state level? I mean, it's just not. I mean, well, the, Utah, well, the when's it going to stay? The Republicans when's it going to turn, push this turn will, lose, will lose office. It's simple as that. That's how democracy works. And I'll tell you where, where the, the politics of this are. The, the Congress could um, codify Roe v. Wade. They keep talking about, talking about doing that, but they don't want to. What, the federal, the federal Congress? Yes, well, Democrats don't have control of it. They've got a, they they've got a, I think a narrow majority in the Senate, and that's it. Hmm. But they do have control of it at the moment. 
Well, that's right. That's right. Sure, sure, yeah. Sorry, they, they, they had control of it for two years and for 18 months after the, the Dobbs decision and they didn't codify Roe. They kept talking about codifying Roe v. Wade, but they didn't. That's because they don't trust the politics of it. No one really knows for sure where the politics are going to go in the in the short term, but I can say with my view in the long term is it'll end up looking like Western Europe, Australia, everywhere else, because that's what the majority of Americans want. Well... I, I, I would say that's all. It's all very lovely and, and all very lovely and and, uh, and 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 a beautiful sentiment. But you try to you try and you, you're trying to convince me that in West Virginia they will turn blue on this. You know it, what? What the net effect of this is that for decades, for decades, women will be oppressed in the most appalling manner. Either that, or have to travel. To states that permit abortion, uh, and and in and in the case of women who are living in poverty, that is just not a reality. So I just I just don't accept that this nonsense. So what's, your, so what's what's your solution? The, the, the solution is basically the, the those Supreme Court justices who who wiped away Roe v. Wade, two of whom. Two of whom one of whom, one of whom's under a corruption cloud at the moment, and and the other two. Sh- Set hand on heart in congressional hearings that they would that, that they would uphold Roe v. Wade. So, what's your solution? Well, the, the, the solution is this is a, this is a failure of the Supreme Court in the first instance, and secondly, these things should be nationally legislated, and and just have the fight. I mean, this is something that is absolutely disgraceful. This is third world stuff. This is this is you know the sort of stuff you'd expect. To see in Uganda or Kenya, and that's well, where the that's where the United States is is at the moment. Certainly, states like like Texas, Utah, West Virginia, and the Carolinas. I just think it's messy politics. But then, um, uh, I, I, I suppose someone could try and codify a Roe v. Wade type situation. The trouble is to try and find some agreement as to um, uh, just where the limits are. It, 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 uh, I don't think you can codify Roe v. Wade as you interpret it, that it's all up to the woman and the doctor because that's not what most people in the Western world agree with. Um, they all want some well, kind of, to, sorry, to, a majority to, to, want some to, kind of limitation. Respectfully, Jack, it's, not, it's none, of their, none of their bloody business, is it really? Yeah, well, what, I, what, what discussions occur between a woman or indeed a man and her doctor are really their business. Personally, I have no interest in interfering with that, but I don't think a majority of people agree with you. And politics is about getting a majority of people to agree with you. No, I don't think there's too much disagreement in 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 basic in Western nations that whatever a woman decides uh, in consultation with her doctor in regard to her reproductive health is a matter matter for them and no one else. I don't think well, that's. Well, no, I, thought, I don't I, think I, that's a. I don't think that's a radical proposition just quite. No, I, well, I think you're wrong. Um, and, and the reason I think you're wrong is that all around Western Europe and indeed most of the Western world, there are limits on abortion. Um, they're generally around, as I say, um, anything goes up until about 20 weeks. Thereafter, it gets a bit harder. They're not onerous restrictions, but there are restrictions all around the Western world, almost without exception. Uh, no, well, look, meanwhile, Ron DeSantis, who really is just going backwards at the moment, he's floated the idea, with a smile on his face, of building a prison near Disney's Florida theme park, Jack. What's going on there, you know? Well, he's having a dispute with Disney because Disney's been operating under a – it has its own little statelet, if you like, like a, a, its own municipal yep. area with its own rules. Um, and he's trying to um, uh, reverse that decision. And there's a sort of a legal dispute, really, as because he put a new board in charge of that little municipal area, took off the Disney-appointed um, uh, people and put um, – state of Florida appointed people in charge of that. Disney sought to find a way around that. And he gave a press conference where he said, well, this is what we're going to do. There's a whole lot of land next to the Disney little municipal area. Um, uh, We could turn it into a national park. We could um, uh, build them further amusement parks. Uh, And he said with a grin on his face at the end, oh, we could put a state prison in there. Now, uh, that's terrible behaviour because I don't like to see the state um, threatening uh, corporations like that because their politics don't agree with me 
Um, that's a this wrong is nothing stuff. I mean, it, it's sort of the stuff that the DeSantis, you know, it, it might have some appeal with right wing conservatives in Florida. But as a presidential candidate, this is something that he shouldn't be getting involved with at all. I, no, mean, probably I understand that the history of this is, this is quite interesting, that, uh, that he has sought to replace the committee that essentially runs this statelet, which is pretty pretty good extre- pretty good explanation from you, about how um, the, the Florida Disney World complex operates. It has, it's, you know, there's even things like road management and so forth that around that uh, complex in Kissimmee. Law, law enforcement, the whole thing. Yeah, all that sort of stuff in, in Kissimmee in Florida. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and, uh, uh, and, and then he implemented, he, he created his own committee to take their place. In the meantime, the old Disney committee put together a, a document that basically enables, um, that will enable this new committee really just control over road, road, uh, road management, traffic management, and, you know, Filling in potholes, excuse me, and, and, and that will and that will end up in the courts and be decided. You know, you know I mean, that's 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 why where it's going to end up. Why would you take on Disney? I mean, we we know why. I mean, he 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 he, he doesn't like he doesn't like the way um, uh, the Disney Corp um, promotes um, and 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 promotes in a very tepid way um, 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 uh, issues around sexuality and gender. Uh, very tepid, tepid way, and and but you just think as a as a potential presidential candidate, and he still hasn't announced. I think someone sent me a text during the week saying, "Oh, he's he's, he's announced," and I don't think he no. has. No, certainly hasn't. nothing formal. He he, uh, he has travelled to uh, New Hampshire to make a speech, uh, but he hasn't formally announced. This is really dumb. This this sort of this stuff loses you, not just elections, but I, but I suspect primaries. It, it, it loses your support from uh, traditional Republicans. Yep. Yeah. Damn. Because, it's, because look, it's dealt with a smile. He's, there's no prospect of them building a slammer yes, no, next is, to the Epcot no, Centre. Yeah, yeah, no. so, uh, so, maximum so, security with guys with uh, razor ribbon just uh, wrapped around the park. No, but, it, uh, it was. It was if you watch the video, it was clearly you know done tongue in cheek, but still, it's dumb. Very dumb. Um, Jack Taxira, twenty-one year old. Um, bit of a tech expert, Jack, uh, had <laughs> as big a security clearance as you can imagine, as, a, as you can actually get in terms of access to classified and top secret information. Uh, he's since been arrested, charged with, charged with multiple counts uh, under the Espionage Act of 1917, Jack, and is looking at uh, a, a minimum 30 years in jail. Um uh, we're starting to see a little bit of the leaks there, Jack, but to some of them, we'll just deal with the leaks first, some of them indicate that things may not be going all that well in uh, Ukraine. Um, yeah, uh, so it would seem. Uh, there's problems with um, uh, with air defence, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, uh, air defence being degraded to the point where it simply won't function by May. Um, we're not going to give an update on the situation in uh, Ukraine at the moment. It really has become a quagmire and and will do so at least until uh, I think the uh, European summer. Um, but there are other things there too, Jack, that were, I found quite interesting that Mossad may have been in, involved in uh, organising or at least promoting and sending some of their agents in to uh, protest against the Netanyahu government's uh, decision to basically override the Supreme Court. Interesting. Yeah, stuff. I was talking to a, a, a Jewish pal uh, about this a little while ago, and and we were looking at the Netanyahu situation and wondering whether um, it was getting a little bit of out of hand because it looked like the security services and the armed forces were were opposed. Um, were opposed. And, yeah, and, when you get that, and, it's... And, 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 and if you're an Israeli prime minister, that's a problem. That's a sign uh, maybe to just step back a little bit. Mm. There's another thing there, Jack, too, and it's been reported in the Washington Post today, and we are recording, I haven't said this, we are recording on the 18th of April, um, that uh, the Egyptians were going to supply um, uh, missiles to, uh, to, uh, to the Russians. And uh, after the Americans uh, intervened, they decided they'd, they'd flog them off to the Ukrainians. Uh, initially, when 
uh, Texera's leaked documents were published, the Egyptians had um, had uh, denied that they were involved in providing um, uh, munitions to the Russians, which is true, but they were actually thinking about it. There are all sorts of all sorts of things. You would think none of these things are particularly staggering. Um, uh, the, the documents that he's released, but that doesn't mean he's uh, not in a fair bit of fair bit of strife, Jack. Um, he was releasing it to a, a very relatively small group of uh, on discourse, which is a sort of chat group, and it can be large groups, it can be small groups. Um, by invitation only. But then a lot of this material got released on Reddit. Some of it's less than two months old. Uh, some of it appeared on Twitter. Some of it appeared on 4chan. Uh, I wrote a piece on Friday saying um, this makes it very, very difficult for uh, any sort of diplomatic uh, uh, um, uh, response to from Australia to Julian Assange's problems, Jack. It certainly creates more and more trouble for Julian Assange, as far as I'm concerned. It does. Um, uh, early they on just the can't piece... forget this stuff. They, 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 they go, oh, well, you can go, but this one we're going to prosecute. They can't do that. No. It's not the way um, US security agencies think. No. Any um, sort of breach, they will want to punish to the hilt. Yeah, yes. I don't think they've been all that consistent about that of late. It depends how far up the food chain you've been. Uh, well, there were some pardons issued for, 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 one yeah. of, uh, for one of Assange's uh, leakers. Oh, um, and, and, and further further up the food chain. Uh, further up the food chain. Oh, well, yeah, that, well, right up the top. Uh, General Petraeus, didn't he get a walk on... Um, uh, on yeah, on, 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 he did, did, yeah. And he was uh, uh, having an affair with a journalist at the time and they were... Happily, um, in sort of some sort of um, uh, post-coital phase, where they'd uh, yeah. where they'd uh, review top secure top top secret documents, he better did off, cop better, a better plea bargain to avoid a jail sentence. Better off lighting a smoke, I think. Uh, in the yeah, I would think so. Yeah, um, but I, uh, yeah, he did he did walk away in that. And I've gone. I guess I could, we we could we could really push the point that top secret and classified material uh, was. Uh, uh, on three occasions, requested from uh, Mara Lago, uh, and uh, ultimately the third inquir- required a search warrant and a raid. And of and, course, and from, uh, the and from Biden, Delaware, Biden residents uh, also had a uh, few boxes in the yeah. garage there. Uh, yeah. The difference, I suppose, is that once Biden was made aware of it, he uh, he, he conducted a comprehensive search. But um, but really, when we when we're getting to these sorts of people. You know, a twenty-one-year-old. How does he get? How does he get clearance, Jack? At twenty-one, uh, because he's good at computers, and the old blokes who issue the clearances aren't. Yeah, that's pretty much it. I think it is, isn't uh, it? That's yeah. what it is. And, and so he's he's been saying, well, you know, all our secrets you you have access to, and the documents themselves they seem to have been lifted. So he's taken. Taken them home. We know this, or well, it's a pretty good guess, because they were photographed um, on top of a, a gun magazine, um, mm. and uh, uh, or a hunting magazine, I should say. And uh, so he, he pulled them out. The covering sheets were folded over, so that means he sort of snuck them in, <laughs> snuck them in the pocket, walked out of the, walked out of the, um, uh, out of the secure building, and then photographed them at home, and then returned them. Mm. What's he looking at, Jack? Oh, yeah. It, it depends how they depends how he's whether he's treated like General Petraeus or like Julian Assange. Well, he's not a general, Jack. That's mm, uh, that's, that's the trouble. Not, it's not going to work for him. Uh, I think yeah. he's got some big problems, and he comes from a very strong military background too, doesn't he? So yeah, yeah um, he's it was. Got a um, it was. Uh, I like the comment from Bill Maher at the early stages when it looked like he was just dropping this on a chat group for young guys. Uh, Bill said, so one thing we know about his motivation, it wasn't to impress girls. Yeah, I don't know how many girls there were. It's a sort of God-loving, gun-loving sort of group, relatively small, I think, 30 or 40 members. Um, but uh, And then he started passing documents around quite recently, and then, of course, they ended up pretty widely circulated. Joe didn't seem all that troubled. He was in Northern Ireland. He said he was concerned that it had happened, but he was cons- – and I think we sort of – from what we understand about the nature of the documents, that it doesn't contain too many um, sort of secrets, as I say, for those expecting Australian uh, 
representations for mercy towards Assange, who still um, is in the UK. Uh, awaiting- Joe, Joe was too busy confusing the black and tans with the all blacks at that stage. Oh, he actually got that right. He actually got that pretty right, and he was he was he was quite right on some of the Irish rugby and where they are at the moment. I thought he, I thought his trip in Northern Ireland, not that it matters much in American consumption. Uh, I thought he was actually quite sprightly there, but she's walking, walking like a you know sort of robot at the moment. And that takes us onto the polls, Jack, uh, and the polls are showing fairly consistently that Trump is ahead of Biden, possibly driven by. <coughs> a bit of recognition around his indictment. Yeah, I've seen some polls since I sent those to you. Um, uh, The latest one I've got is a McClatchy poll that has DeSantis beating um, Biden um, in in Arizona and Pennsylvania, two key swing states, uh, and Trump behind Biden in both of those states. So it looks like maybe DeSantis is going better um, than uh, than we think. The other thing I saw was a it's just called a social media study. Forty thousand real individual swing voters, um, and they look at their social media um, for the for a, a period of time. And what that shows is that Trump has lost the support of the vast majority of swing voters. Something uh-huh. that we've been saying here, uh-huh. um, and but that DeSantis is outperforming Trump. So um, the uh, the social media study um, supports what we've been saying, I think, is that uh, probably Biden beats Trump in a matchup and maybe DeSantis beats Biden. Seems that way. And, and, and I think that's the conventional wisdom. It's early days, but the conventional wisdom around the Republican the Party is that too, isn't it? You know, that, that if Trump does succeed in a primary and perhaps with a little bit of... Um, a little bit of uh, <coughs> needing of things by the Democrat Party to bring bring uh, Trump uh, perhaps under not just under one in, one indictment but perhaps multiple indictments uh, that that will propel him into the primaries and then create the nightmare uh, where where they can't basically win enough independent voters over or swinging voters if you want to call them that and uh, and Biden wins uh, the presidency. Meanwhile, Jack, have you bought your cup? Because they're out. Have you bought your coronation mug or cup and saucer yet? I thought you'd be racing to the internet to order a couple. Yeah, no, the, the, the most impressive thing we ever had in our family, mate, was my brother who was born on Australia Day, got an Australia Day spoon, I think. Um, no, 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 no coronation for King Charles. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I, I actually follow um, on Instagram a, a, a young historian who goes through uh, the processes have been going through the processes around coronation. The coronation chair, Jack. Have you heard about the coronation chair? Yeah, I, I do actually know a bit about. Yeah, some I know of this stuff. a little bit about the coronation chair. It's it's a it's a very old chair. I think it was first built in the 13th century, and it's only used only used for the coronation. Where would they put it after that? Do you know, what are they just no, no, put it in the attic? Probably, probably <laughs> does in the, chair, uh, in the chapel way. or in the dungeon. Probably there'd be one there. Speak, speaking of chairs, um, my father, who at this stage was selling insurance down in the Western District, called into an old mate he'd known. Uh, years ago, and sitting in the in their lounge room in their soldier settlement place down in Western District was this huge, you know, well, quite substantial, you know, padded red chair. Um, and he asked them about it. They said that the Queen and Prince Philip bought it out and 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 sent it to them when they came to Australia because it was the chair their son sat on at the investiture of Prince Charles as Prince of Wales. And the reason their son got us got to go was that he was the chap who you see in the photos at Timbertop, uh, who, right. who went back to school to um, to be a pal with Charles. He was twenty, I think, or twenty one when he went to Timbertop. Bit old for a fourth form boy, but um, uh, they sent a couple of older boys back to be his best pal. Well, he, according to what I read about his time at Timbertop and pretty much the time through his life, he's hadn't had any mates, and so they probably had to make mm, they, a few they, for they him. They probably had to hire him a couple, yeah. <laughs> Couple of mates for him. Um, anyway, 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 the, the, the focus the, really of the coronation is is how the stink's going to go when uh, when Harry. Well, he's not invited. Is he? he's not? Won't be at the uh, ceremony. No, he's going to be at the ceremony, and and oh, and, okay. the, and the reason he's going, according to the uh, the royal correspondence, is that his whole brand relevance is about proximity to the king. So he needs to be there. 
Yeah. But the best comment I saw on all this was on Twitter. If King Charles' coronation doesn't end with William and Harry having a televised drunken punch-up in a pub car park, I want my taxes refunded. <laughs> Um, it's not going to be quite the same as Betty Two's uh, coronation where she toured around the city for, I think, five or six hours. Uh, Charles is just doing a bit of a whistle stop through London and um, and then it'll all be over. He'll be catching the tube, won't he? Uh, well, if he, he, might, he might actually, well, they do have the... Um, <clears throat> They do have the horse-drawn carriage deck, so it's almost, almost, um, almost uh, carbon neutral. Um, but he does have, doesn't he have uh, uh, a car that runs on wine and cheese waste? So he might have to drive that in there too. I think it actually it might be an Aston Martin. Um, very strange times. Jack, how long's the, how long's the, I mean, if we don't start having a conversation about the Republic in Australia, I know we're going to get through the voice first, but it, I don't think there's any other. Are we, are we going to wait till Charles dies and then we'll think about it again? Um, that, surely this, this is high time for Australia to start having a look at having having a discussion about its uh, links to this well, rather bizarre well, institution. Well there, well, there are two things that have improved the chances of winning a Republican referendum. Um, uh, but the Queen Elizabeth II is no longer the monarch um, uh, and Peter Fitzsimons is no longer the uh, chairperson of the Australian Republican group. <laughs> That's very cruel, but probably true in uh, the latter element there, Jack. Um, <clears throat> yes, look, uh, we do have, of course, we have a minister for the ref- for the for for um, uh, for, for Ma- a rep- Matt Thistlewaite, not- is that right? Yeah, Matt Thistlewaite is the uh, uh, not a cabinet member, but uh, that's his. Um, uh, that's his ballywick at the moment, and the thought is it will be a second term thing for uh, Anthony Albanese. Gee, gee, that'd, that'd, be a, that'd, that'd, that'd be a good job, wouldn't it, being Minister for the Republic? Because for the first term, you can sit there and say, with, with your feet on the chair, saying, Look, I'm working on this. You know? Yeah, well, 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 there's also a downside, Jack. He has to spend a bit of time with Peter Fitzsimons. So. Oh, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, not, not an easy job under those yeah, aspects. Every, every, every silver lining has a cloud. Every, every silver lining has a cloud, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, no, indeed. Um, uh, I didn't know this, and I, I think you didn't either, but um, in terms of um, um, Burns victims, they're now using fish skin to. to re- to, to, for, for people suffering serious burns. Uh, and fish skin from the tilapia, that dreadful um, uh, uh, farm-raised fish from Vietnam that uh, um, that is it sold in the less salubrious establishments. But apparently it, it, it carries some sort of kind of antibacterial uh, aspect to it. So you can just whack it on without dressings mm. onto the skin of burns unit um, and it's sort of pain-free and, um, and heals them up I do know also, and and I have very little expertise on these matters, but, but you know we used to uh, we used to uh, sort of mock um, uh, certain uh, public health systems that weren't perhaps up to up to scratches using leeches and maggots mm. to clean to clean mm. wounds, but maggots are being used a bit now to uh, to clean wounds around the world in established uh, medical settings. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. I can tell you, um, in my career as a lawyer, I had to visit a few hospitals to talk to clients who. So I did a lot of personal injuries work. You know, people who'd been in um, badly injured in industrial accidents of various kinds, um, and the the most um, disturbing place I've ever had to visit is the serious burns units in a couple of a couple of occasions. Um, yeah, uh, one, yeah. Look, one, uh, one needed a strong drink after that, I can tell yeah, you. Yeah, it, it's just appalling. And and you, you can only imagine the pain that people mm. go through with, with serious burns. Um, and just, just that little stovetop injury yourself, you would have caught a few on the fingers. Yeah. Hurts like hell. And then imagine that around 40% of your body, just a terrible mm. thing. Uh, great to see some um, techno- yeah. technological advances in that, Jack. Now, we'll get to technology in a little bit here, but you want to talk about energy and this is the fires project this is a uk government fires project it is uh, more or less publicly funded and it is a genuine group that makes re- or that delivers reports on the uk's progress towards net zero and i'll let you go jack this is uh, what they say is uh, what net zero really means 
Well, well, you can put up the whole um, the whole uh, thing on on the Facebook thing. But the, the key take key points were that they say to get to net zero, all all airports except Heathrow, Belfast, and Glasgow to close by twenty thirty. No flying at all um, uh, by twenty fifty. Um, no new petro diesel cars by um, uh, twenty thirty, I think, and by twenty sixty three. Road use restricted to sixty percent of today's level. Food, energy, and um, heating and energy restricted to sixty percent by twenty fifty. That means either a colder, hungrier population or a massive depopulation. Well, yes and no, Jack. Yes and no, because yeah. FIRES acknowledges that the data that they put together and that has been published, just published very recently, is actually based on 2022, because when this, when this data was compiled, mm. 2022 technology. It, it assumes, and, and, they, and this is their, you know, this is their, um, um, uh, the, 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 the explanatory notes, uh, that it assumes that there are no technological advances from 2022 to 2050. What's the 2050, sorry. Uh, and that, is not quite right, is it? Because it, it assumes that uh, un, that there'll be un, no no carbon benefits from unscaled energy sector or negative emissions technologies. It's assuming that there will be no advances in negative em, uh, emissions technologies. And no, it's, it, of, it's it's using current technology. That's yeah, right. That's right. So it might seem a little bit alarmist. It certainly is, really, when you think about it. No flying uh, and. Uh, and uh, food, heating, and energy restricted to sixty percent of popular of, of, of what it is at the moment um, by twenty fifty. Um, but it's, this is this is assuming it, that, it won't that, be no flying. We'll just go back to what life was like in the in the nineteen seventies. Um, um, uh, well, flying it's will be smoke on fl- board. Flying will be able will, will be the preserve of the world to do it. Uh, no, what about what about zeppelins, Jack? We've got technology like that now. In fact, zeppelins are actually increasing. And I know we don't call them zeppelins. We're supposed to call them airships um, or dirigibles. But, yes, they're actually uh, uh, using them more and more now to transfer freight across continents um, and very low emissions, of course. Uh, Germany, Jack, you want to talk about that? Uh, they've, they're about to shut down their three remaining nuclear power stations. I think they did on the weekend. Did they? Okay. Yeah. And that and that does mean, in the short term, that they will be burning more coal, doesn't it? Um, yeah, yes, it does. <laughs> Quite a lot more coal. And they burn shitty coal. The Germans, they burn, I mean, they, they, they burn, do import. They burn. It's, it's, with, it's even worse than Latrobe Valley brown coal, I think. Um, uh, what do they call it? Is it called anthracite? Um, uh, lig- lignite. Lignite, that's right. Yeah, and it's brown and dirty and burns dirty, burns uh, uh, burns uh, slowly and dirty. Um, Any, anybody from Victoria who ran a briquette um, uh, water heater will know what we're talking about. Yeah, indeed. Um, it comes straight from your lawn. Um, uh, there are some issues there. Now, look, we, we, we talked about nuclear power. Uh, and the and the and the difficulties with the big uh, <coughs> with, with 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 the big energy provide, providers, you know, France is well established, but it had difficulties with heat waves last year, um, and and the UK has a major nuclear reactor being built, which will provide about thirty percent of it, and it's taken twenty years, and it's cost blowouts, it's sixty billion dollars, and all that sort of stuff. And then we've talked about some of the modular stuff, which actually might be of use. Now I know some people are completely opposed to nuclear nuclear e- energy of of any description because you can, under the right under the wrong circumstances, end up with a Fukushima or, or a or a Chernobyl. Um, but uh, the simple fact of the matter is that it is clean, not necessarily totally um, zero carbon emitting, but um, um, but nevertheless, um, the Germans are closing this down, and this is a political decision rather than uh, a decision around emissions. Do you mean it's not the science? Well, it, it, it probably isn't. I mean, I, I, I haven't had a look at these three power plants. Are they degraded? Do they need extra work? Do they? Do they? I mean, the, the Germans bought in a um, uh, decided they were going to phase out all of their nuclear power after Fukushima. 
Mm. Um, and, now, that's and, a political decision. No, that's well, not a science it, it, decision. It's definitely a political decision. But the political decision was based on, oh, hang on, we don't want, you know, literally hundreds of square kilometres of our land that can't be used for 50,000 years. Um, so, you know, that, that that's the basis of it. Um, having said that, uh, um, to the best of my knowledge, there are three remaining nuclear power plants aren't based on oceans and uh, subject to seismic events. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, look, uh, it's, it's, it's when we look at German governments, Jack, the, the German Green Party is a significant player and it's very different, isn't it, from the Australian Greens Party. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. The, the, the Greens, the Greens in in, in Germany are, uh, are much more practical than our Greens. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, I mean, the the Greens in Germany um, uh, passed the legislation to increase the use of um, lignite, of dirty brown coal. Mm. Um, um, I know just recently they, they do need Australian coal, Jack. And and mm. uh, look, I looked at their figures in terms of coal imports, and it's around twenty million US. So that's sorry, no, not not US dollars. I should I do apologise to our listeners. Twenty million tons, which is absolutely zero. Well, near enough, and so they're burning their own coal, which is brown and dirty, to replace uh, the closure of their three nuclear power plants. Have been some major advances in renewables in in Germany. Meanwhile, Jack, we haven't discussed Hungary very much, but they are probably NATO's biggest concern and the EU's greatest concern going forward, aren't they? Because Um, of their very close embrace of Russia. Yeah, well, they've got a different relationship with Russia to a fair bit of Eastern Europe. Yes, that's true. Uh, This comes after um, uh, (coughs) the US imposed sanctions on three Hungarian officials uh, Budapest said it will withdraw its representatives from the Russian-led, uh, the Russia-led International Investment Bank, and exit the institution. The Hungarian e- Economy Ministry said on April 13 that the government had concluded that the bank's operations had become meaningless as a result of the U.S. sanctions. On April 12, Washington slapped sanctions on three top Hungarian IIB, that's the International Investment Bank officials, after it said Budapest had ignored US concerns over the opaque Kremlin platform. But perhaps more interestingly, Jack, um, uh, Hungary has now signed new agreements to ensure its continued access to Russian energy. Um, This was reported in CNN uh, where they made an errata, um, but the correct figure is 150 euros they've agreed to pay for. Uh, for Russian energy, 150 euros per megawatt hour. Hmm. Um, what happens, Jack? I mean, how, how does the EU, firstly, how does the EU respond to this? Well, I think the EU's got to recognise, and, and in fact, I think the West has got to recognise, not everyone agrees with the majority West position on Ukraine. Um, the Indians don't, uh, the Chinese don't. Um, uh, the Israelis don't, um, uh, quite a few people, quite a few people around the world um, don't agree with the, um, the current um, conventional wisdom on the Ukraine-Russian situation. Tell me a little bit about the Hungarian government, Jack, politically. Well, there are, how would you put it, um, uh, there are reasonably authoritarian yes. uh, um, uh, right wing government, um, but but it's but it's not. Then I, I don't. I haven't been able to find I any. Would say, I would. I would also describe them as nationalist. A nationalist. Yeah, government. they are, and they're. they're yeah, yeah, they're they're all very Hungarian. Um, but but it's not a situation. I mean, I've heard some people on on social media. I've seen some people on social media, sort of describing them as kind of neo-fascist, and I think that's nonsense. Um, no one's fleeing. People aren't fleeing Hungary to get away from the um, the jackbooted troops or anything like that. It's you know, people people go there quite happily on holidays, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a problem for NATO, and it's one to keep an eye on. We need to very quickly move now to Africa and. Sudan, Jack, there have been reports uh, really starting around about Saturday of clashes in Khartoum. Khartoum Airport closed um, and uh, uh, clashes between the Sudanese military and the rapid support forces. And many people might have been confused about what 
that is. And it's basically a paramilitary group uh, within Sudan um, <coughs> run by General Mohammed Hamdan Dagolo and rather like uh, Dagolo, I should say, um, and rather like Idi Amin, he's a self-appointed general, self, uh, self-titled. He's better known as Hamed, Hamedti. Uh, and he is the leader of the RSF, RSF, and he has been able to assemble a military force that is greater than the Sudanese army, Jack. Mm. Um, well, it's, it's warlord country, isn't it? It is warlord. Well, he is actually a former warlord himself, a sort of link to mm. warlords. Um, and um, uh, uh, <laughs> Sudan is part of the sorrow of Africa, one of those real flashpoints in terms of the sorrow of Africa. Um, and while Africa has made uh, great leaps in many parts and moves towards uh, democracy, Sudan remains this kind of unresolvable issue at the moment. They were headed towards some form of reconciliation, some form of newly elected central government, uh, and uh, now there's fighting on the streets there with reports of multiple deaths. Uh, uh, and not just soldiers, we're talking about citizens. So it, 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 it just remains to be seen. I mean, Hamedti is actually sort of imposing himself on the process. Um, so he will be given, and he has, and he does this with, with significant military force. Uh, I noticed there was uh, footage of uh, the Sudanese army using MiGs, I think, uh, had, had MiGs in the air in Khartoum. Um, but uh, they are pretty much being overwhelmed by this Basic, basically warlord, uh, and who wants to count himself in as a player in a new Sudan. God only knows when that happens, but uh, we'll need to get to it. Um, uh, child labour laws, Jack, let's briefly touch on that. When was your first job? When was your first job? You work, You would have worked with your dad at the dairy, wouldn't you? Uh, yeah, even before that, I think I was probably... Uh, nine or something, um, not quite ten anyway, um, uh, uh, delivering the paper, delivering the Melbourne Sun. Oh, right. Um, on the I bike. Think I, th- I think I had uh, on the bike, I think I had uh, uh, 90, 95 or 96 papers to deliver. Um, uh, what, you earn every, about two or three bucks? Uh, probably about that. I think everyone got a Melbourne Sun uh, and the local solicitor and the local doctor got the Melbourne Age as well, but they got the Sun too. Um, um, what about the Australian? And any of those? No, it was pre the Australian, but I think. Oh, we're coming back. Oh, good <laughs> Lord. What's, so we're going back away. I, 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 can't remember, I can't remember what year the Australian started, but I don't think the Australian was ever delivered into the um, rural areas cause, because they were flying it around to get it to places and that, that sort of stuff. Some, yeah. uh, some good stories about that, uh, which I'll uh, explain at another time. But we're, we're, we're raising this. I, I had my first job at Downey's uh, when I was about 15, um, assembling things. Uh, things that probably didn't even need to be assembled in very basic work. Uh, Downies were, in fact, uh, manufacturers of uh, beer dispensing equipment, a uh, fine group of people. Um, and uh, but we're talking about livable wages for not just for adults but for kids because we're seeing them, particularly in the fast food industry, Jack, just not getting paid nearly enough. Mm. Yeah, that's that's the trouble though. Is most people want these want their kids to have these jobs, and the kids want the jobs, uh, and they've never been living wages ever you know, no. in, in history. Um, uh, so it's a it's a rewriting of history. Can I just contrast that with um, just quickly with uh, a, a, um, a a document that was dropped from a, a top twenty American law firm, and this is their expectation of young graduates. Um, you're in the big leagues, which is a privilege, act like it. We are in the business of client service. You are a concierge of the four seasons. The client always comes first. You are online 24-7, no exceptions, no excuses, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I just wonder, <laughs> there's sort of madness on both ends of this, isn't there? Yeah, right? that's 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 complete control. I mean, that, that that is essentially control. When you when you're not just talking about being online, as on you know having access to the internet and Facebook chatting and all that sort of stuff. We are actually talking about their internal servers, an intranet where you are basically observable by someone within the business twenty four seven. 
Yeah, contrast that to when I was a young lawyer and uh, if people rang the office and said, um, uh, can, I speak to Mr. Ho- can I speak to Mr. Hoy? He said, well, he's, he's out of the office. It is, um, it uh, is the afternoon. It, he's out of the office and, and they would make known to uh, the staff who they were. They'd say, oh, well, Jack's at um, so-and-so. <laughs> he's having lunch. You'll be able to join him there, you know, or call him there. It was a much more civilised time. Look, we're just going to very quickly touch on electric vehicles and we just remind listeners that Jack owes me a very, very long lunch because, well, I, I, I can't even remember the terms of it, but I know I've won. It's um, going to cost me It's going to cost me a much or a lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Americans' adoption of electric vehicles is proving to be slow as relatively few currently own one, 4%, or are seriously considering purchasing one, 12%. Another 43% of US adults say they might consider buying an electric vehicle in the future, while 41% unequivocally said they would not. That's a Gallup poll. Um uh, one big thing, Jack, is that uh, there's just been maybe a, 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 a game changer on all of this. There's just been some exploration in, uh, uh, I believe, the Northern Territory, and I may be wrong about this, could be South Australia, uh, where there have been uh, deposits of um, what we might call, uh, well, what are known as very rare precious metals that that, were, that are sorely needed for um, for uh, for the construction of batteries and so forth. We, Australia, does have the largest deposits of lithium, um, so we're going to benefit from this in that respect. But then there are other rare metals that go into electric vehicles and the batteries in particular, and we seem to be in pretty good shape for those too. Hmm. Uh, do we have any child labourers to mine the lithium, which is supposed to be the worst done <laughs> well, in Africa? Yeah, or... Don't laugh. I mean, the, 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 the sorts of rare metals that are that are being uh, that are being uh, ripped out of the ground in places like the DRC involve an enormous amount of child exploitation. But then, Jack, when you pop on your running shoes uh, in uh, in the afternoon and go for a bit of a stroll, you're probably assisting that industry as well. Mm. Got any car? Got any rugs? Got the Indian rugs on the floor there? Because mm. that's probably a little bit of that going on there too. Um, Sport, Jack. The AFL had their gather round weekend. Um, uh, in and, the fine uh, city of Adelaide. Yeah, look, I, I, I think it was considered a success. I think I'd prefer Carlton to play uh, Adelaide uh, at, um, uh, at the Carlton's home ground than Adelaide's, but it looks like it'll be on for another three years. That was announced yeah. after the round. I was just wondering whether they had a, a serial murderer to welcome to the city of Adelaide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when things were going badly. And they went very badly, very quickly against uh, when Carl were playing Adelaide on the Thursday night. I did start to refer. I mean, I, 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 I regret it now, but I was referring to many of the people in the crowd as serial killers. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but uh, you know, Adelaide uh, emerged uh, with, a, with, a, with a solid reputation as a side that's emerging. Uh, Melbourne, who we thought were the, were the guns, got, got beaten. Um, it's a very strange season, uh, and uh, and the gather round was uh, was completed by an excellent game of footy uh, between Collingwood and St Kilda. Not necessarily high scoring. Collingwood got the chocolates uh, with the Saints. Um, it could have gone. It could have gone the other way, or at least got to a draw stage. Um, and St Kilda got their clearance with about thirty seconds to go, and uh, and a scrub kick uh, ended up in Collingwood hands, and that was pretty much the end of it. But uh, two very good sides emerging there too. Well, Collingwood aren't an emerging side; they, they are a good side now after last season. But St Kilda with a new coach. And also, we've got all this um, emerging talent, Jack. Uh, particularly yeah, that's what around struck the ball. Me. That's what struck me um, over the weekend was just how many young players there are there w- who are playing, um, you know, the, the, the sub-22-year-olds, if you like, um, mm. who look like they'll be 10-year Ready players. Ready-made. Yeah, yeah, ready-made goers, you know. Uh, Horn Francis, Dacos, Ginevan, Sheasel, Philippu, Ashcroft, uh, the two from the Swans, Warner and Golden, the, the, the two De Koenig brothers, you know. Um, there are well, just virtually so- everyone you mentioned, they're on ballers. So they they come ready-made to the, to, to the AFL with that capacity to run 16, 17 kilometres in a game, mm. and then their bodies get stronger, but they have that aerobic capacity to start off with. And that's quite yeah. extraordinary, isn't it, from eight yeah. and old kids? Yeah, uh, and, and I know Ginevan's a bit of a controversial figure, but he kicked 40 goals as a small forward last year, and well, if you yeah, do that a, in your first... Small forward. Uh, yeah. yeah, he had his first game back <laughs> against the Saints after, I think, uh, an imposed... Uh, 
Um, and, and yes, I think, he, I think he might have been doing the marching powder on video. Was, you know? uh, <laughs> it, it, it seems to have caught a few of them. But um, also, uh, we'll just briefly touch on uh, the rugby league. The Storm got beaten. It's very hard to figure out form in that too. Uh, I think uh, the Cowboys got beaten. Um, and uh, there just seemed to be a couple of easy beats in it in the West Tigers, in form of the West Tigers, and the Dragons, Jack, that most uh, famous of clubs for winning 11 premierships in a row are really battling in the NRL. Yeah, they've been uh, battling. They had a little brief moment in the sun when uh, Wayne Bennett was coaching them, but apart from that, they've been yeah, battling for a long time. Been slim pickings for a very, very long time. Um, just wanted to briefly touch on the Premier League, Jack, and Arsenal have just got the jitters. Uh, they're on top of the ladder. I think they're three points ahead of uh, a hard-finishing uh, Man City, and uh, they played West Ham. That's Arsenal played the West Ham on the weekend. Two zip up, missed a penalty, and then just got you know, basically West Ham, who were kind of in... Uh, in the Reds, kind of in the red zone, maybe a pink zone in terms of you know, relegation, uh, came up and kicked a couple of quick ones. And and uh, so Arsenal, uh, in a game they would have expected to win, uh, Drew and uh, Man City are breathing down their necks as we speak. Uh, yeah, and they, and they will play each other in less than a fortnight, actually. Yeah, at, yeah. Uh, at Man at Man City, at the, so at, uh, that will define it. At the Etihad Stadium, uh, Arsenal find themselves um, uh, they're on the horse uh, coming down the Flemington Straight. They've been a fair way in front, um, and they're just thinking this is a long straight, and it's they're a just long straight. Hope, it's hoping long, they and hang it on. Seems to be a hill, and it's getting steeper as yeah. they go. And they're, um, they're, they're just going up and down in the one spot, pretty much. And Man City are closing on them. It's going to be. I, 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 and they're, I'm and they're, they're looking nervous. On, I'm going to get up and watch the uh, the Man City um, Arsenal game, and probably on some hideous hours. Most of the European soccer is, but uh, in Australia. But uh, yeah, check that out and see how they get on. Uh, just uh, for those followers. Uh, of football again, Wrexham Jack. Uh, you know, Wrexham owned yeah. by the two Hollywood foes, Ryan Reynolds and yeah. uh, the fellow from uh, It's Sunny, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. They're both terrific blokes, and it's just a wonderful story. And I recommend uh, the documentary, which I think is a Netflix thing, to anyone who hasn't watched it. It's just a wonderful thing what they've done there. Uh, and they are on top three points clear. Uh, I looked at there are only four more games left in the National League where they play, which is the, the absolute bottom of the kind of professional, semi-professional league, uh, and they're three points in front and looking okay to get promoted. Um, and if they do, they immediately get about a million and a half quid in uh, in television rights. It's a wonderful story, and uh, and it's given that Wrexham, which has claims to be the oldest, Football side in the uh, in the country, uh, and was just uh, you know just looking at absolute absolute failure and looking at sort of the abyss and and uh, it's now restored great great faith to this Northern Wales uh, uh, town. Good luck to them. We hope they do all right. Now, Jack, take us out. What have we got here? Turning up in the New York Times, and I thought you had some sort of political. Uh, Political uh, boycott of the New York Times. No, no, not at all. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm actually. I think it, I'm paying twenty. Sobs, I'm paying twenty Australian subs a month to look at it, and I think that's probably a bit too much. I'm having yeah, a, a review bit, of my it, subscription. It's it, it's a bit dull for paying money for. I I just kind of skirt around the uh, um, uh, skirt around the uh, the. Oh, no, I get around the paywall. I hope you don't yeah. do that with the Australian. Otherwise, I'll no, call no, the no, 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 no. I I, I I pony up every. It's the only thing I pay for is the Australian. Oh, right. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's good. Um, that, we like that. Like to hear that. The the, uh, the nearly a third of all shoplifting arrests in New, this is on Twitter this week. Um, at New York City last year involved just 327 people, the police That's said. incredible. Collectively, they were arrested and re-arrested more than <laughs> 6,000 times. And one of the responses to that was, I feel like there is a solution in here somewhere. Yeah, I think if you got through to those 327 people, though, Jack, there'd be another 327 people who'd come forward because what we're probably talking about here is organised shoplifting rackets. It is, it uh, is. And... Um, and uh, it is part of a, part of organised crime. The great George David Freeman, well, not so great, um, uh, the infamous George David Freeman, 
uh, before he became the power of Sydney um, uh, Sydney gangsters through his uh, through his uh, illegal gaming activities was a, was a professional shoplifter. He was getting pinched every year. You know, they're just yeah. bold as brass. They just walk in and grab a couple of suits, half a dozen suits out of the out of the Hugo Boss store, and just walk straight out the front door. Yeah. So they do get pinched quite a lot. Yeah, um, and also Jack like was. The only thing you, I like from was from the UK. They have they have got a, a junior doctor's strike going yes. on there. Yeah, um, chronically they, underpaid, by the way. <clears throat> they are a horrible terribly paid. paid. That's, that's for the work they do. They're getting paid, you know, sort of piece work rages. <laughs> they eight quid an hour for this. You know, they're putting yeah. on eighty hours a week. Anyway, yeah, go on. But we, Sorry, we, we, we can do a whole section on what's wrong with the National Health Service, if you like. I'm happy to do that. Uh, um, well, as my uh, as my uh, uh, great mate Stuart McCure once said, uh, um, uh, um, uh, that uh, it, it is the second biggest employer in the world. Uh, the People's Liberation Army is the biggest one, but uh, the National Health kills more people. Yes, <laughs> that's probably right. Anyway, the, 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 a response on Twitter to this strike was, if you're currently in hospital, please be aware that junior doctors are on strike again today. There will, however, be a, a National Health Service Equality and Diversity Manager on hand if you want to have an open but respectful conversation about colonial reparations. <laughs> that will. That is uh, going to be a great solace to those who are crook and a bit injured. Uh, in the NHS. Thank you very much, Jack. And that takes us out today. Uh, we want to thank our listeners for tuning in. We've had a bit of a, uh, a we've had a bit of a, a frank exchange of views on a range of topics today, Jack. And I thank you very much for joining me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. And uh, we encourage our listeners to drop us a line. Actually, I got something from the uh, something from Baseman, which we will deal with next week, Jack. Um, uh, I'll give you plenty of notice on that one. Uh, but we do encourage our listeners to drop us a line. Let us know what they think. We've got a bit, got a bit of uh, got a bit of Twitter discussion uh, going uh, during the week, Jack. Not in, not much of it entirely complimentary, but that's Twitter for you. Um, and. Um, and uh, yes, so we do encourage our, our listeners to drop us a line, and it doesn't have to be a, it doesn't have to be a subtweet. You know, we're, we're we're big enough and ugly enough to take some criticism. So drop us a line. You can get hold of me on uh, Jack the Insider or at Jack the Insider on Twitter, uh, and uh, my DMs are always open. And Jack, uh, you, you're um, Hong Kong Jack at Substack dot com. Uh, yeah, Hong Kong Jack dot Substack dot com. The secret with Twitter is to enjoy it, but don't take it too seriously. There you go. Thank you very much. We'll see you later, listeners. We'll catch you next week.